evening. Hello. <laughs> Thanks. Good clapping. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Woohoo. <laughs> Super good. Well, thanks uh, so much, for, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Tom Abel. I'm a professor here at Slack and at Stanford Physics. Um, we're going to do the important things first. Uh, we need to know what happens during an earthquake. Um, actually, we had one, so the screen was shaking. Uh, the one thing, key thing to do is we stay inside. We sort of duck. We don't, get, uh, don't run outside. Don't run in things. For a fire, I guess we want to get away from it. <laughs> That's a good idea. You had a chance to sort of uh, study that up. Exit's going to be down here and also on the top um, in case something goes wrong. Uh, I do think it's quite unlikely uh, today. I have the great pleasure um, that we have Sunil with us. Sunil Golwai, actually, uh, he did a PhD in Berkeley um, over 10 years ago already. Don't want to date you uh, or anything. He then went on, did a postdoc at Caltech. Um, he must have impressed a lot of people there because he joined the faculty, uh, has uh, been there ever since. And he's going to uh, tell us about some exciting physics that he can do underground. Right. Here, Sunil, please. No? How about now? Okay, good. All right, well, thanks very much, Tom. So um, my name is Sunil Gawala. I'm from Caltech. I'm going to tell you about uh, dark matter. The title of my talk is Deep Science, Mining for Dark Matter. And uh, so I'll obviously tell you about why we think there's dark matter in the universe and also a bit about the ways we try to search for it and our current results so far. And I'd like you to take away three things from this talk. One is that um, we can ask really remarkably fundamental questions about the universe. We can ask the question, what is most of the universe made of? Is it made of the same stuff that we're made of? And we can try to answer that question. It's, it's in the realm of science, not philosophy. Now. Um, second is that you're going to see through this talk how you know, physics evolves. It's not a static science, and it's also a science that's kind of a, it's a successive approximation where we have one theory that works in the regimes that we know about, but then we go make new observations, we learn new things, we see, oh, it was an approximation, and we have to extend it. And that dark matter is definitely a case of that type. And then third, uh, there's a lot of neat technology that's involved in how you do these experiments, these very challenging experiments to look for dark matter. And I hope that'll be uh, interesting for you. OK, so let's start with a really simple thing. How do you weigh things? Because that's going to be one of the critical issues in this talk, is how you figure out how much the galaxies and clusters of galaxies, how much mass they have. And you know that on Earth, we can weigh things by using a balance. We put the thing we want to weigh on one side, an apple, and then we put weights on the other side until the two sides balance. right? And the reason this works is because we're sitting on top of the Earth, right? And what's happening is that when we balance, the gravitational force acting on the weights is the same as the gravitational force acting on the apple, OK? And the gravitational force is proportional to the mass here and the mass here. So when the balance balances out, we know the gravitational forces are equal, and therefore the masses are equal. So that's how we weigh things on the Earth. And let me just um, uh, point out that the difference, again, between mass and weight. So weight is the force, the force of gravity on an object. If you weigh 100 pounds, that's because the Earth is exerting 100 pounds of gravitational force on you. Mass is the amount of stuff in an object. That doesn't change depend no matter where you are. On the moon, you'll weigh six times less, but the mass will be the same. So what we're doing is here we're balancing weights, and that balances masses. Now, a different way to measure uh, masses and weights is to use a scale. And what, the way a scale's working is it's actually going and directly measuring the force. Because this thing is sitting again on the Earth, there's a gravitational force acting downward on the apple. And then there's a scale, uh, there's a spring inside the scale. And as the apple pushes down, it compresses the spring. And at the point where the spring is compressed and its force pushing back on the apple is the same as the Earth's gravity pulling down on the apple, that's when the balance, uh, when the scale stops and the needle tells you the reading. And someone has calibrated the relationship between the force on the spring and the mass of the object sitting on top of the scale. But in all cases, we're using, uh, we're using a balance of forces, or in this case, uh, the force of gravity versus the force of the spring to figure out the weight and mass of something. So now, the question is, suppose you want to weigh a galaxy. You just put on a scale? Uh, no, right? But you use the same idea. You want to use the idea of relating masses to forces. And that's what we're going to do here to understand how uh, to weigh galaxies. So this is a picture of a very nice spiral galaxy called the Whirlpool Galaxy. And you can see that there are these spiral arms and this disk of stars and gas. And that disk rotates coherently. 
And in fact, you can measure the velocity that the disk rotates, not so much in this one because it's face on, but in other spiral galaxies. You can measure the velocity of the stars and gas going around the center by looking at the light coming off of those stars and gas. Uh, when the, uh, just like when you hear a police siren or an ambulance siren and the ambulance is coming toward you, the pitch increases and when the ambulance is moving away, the pitch decreases. The same thing happens for light. Um, when stars are moving toward you, the light gets, goes to higher frequency. It gets blue shifted, it gets bluer. When the stars are going away from you, the light goes to lower frequency, it gets red shifted and becomes redder. You can use these red shifts and blue shifts to measure velocities of stars and gas in galaxies like, like the Whirlpool Galaxy and measure what the velocity is as a function of how far you are out from the center. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to relate that velocity to the forces that must be acting on the stars and gas. And there's a very simple analogy. So this is an athlete doing a hammer throw. And you know that before he lets go of the hammer, he's spinning it around in a circle trying to increase the speed. And during that time, he's making it go around in a circle. To make it go around in a circle, you have to exert something called a centripetal force. It's the force that's needed to make something go in a circle. And its size is mv squared over r. m is the mass of the, the, the ball, v is the speed that it's moving at, and r is the radius of the circle. So what he's doing is he's exerting, an athlete, uh, he's exerting a force through the metal string that's attached to the ball that exactly provides the centripetal force to make it go around in a circle. Okay? Now in a galaxy, the same thing's happening, except now instead of him being able to pull on a, on a metal uh, wire, instead we have gravity. Okay? Gravity is the only force that we know of that's acting on these very large scales. And it must be that gravity is pulling inward to make the stars and gas go around in a circle. Okay? So just as we equated the force that the athlete's um, applying to the force needed to keep something moving in a circle, we do the exact same thing with a galaxy. And you can relate the velocity of the stars and gas to the amount of mass enclosed in a certain radius. So m star is the mass of your star or gas cloud or whatever. r is the distance out from the center. Uh, v is the speed that the star or gas is moving at. g is a constant uh, that, that we know from other measurements. And then m is the mass enclosed in a certain radius. Okay? So you can tie the centripetal force to the gravitational force and thus measure the amount of mass in the galaxy. Okay? So now people have been doing this for a number of years. Vera Rubin's group at uh, Carnegie, uh, at the um, Carnegie Observatories in Washington was one of the very first groups to do this well in the late 60s and early 70s. And here's a, a typical measurement of this type where uh, they looked at the stars themselves and then once you get further out you could look at clouds of gas in a way I'll describe in a second and measured the velocity of the stars and gas as a function of how far out they are. So up along here is the speed in kilometers per second and this is distance from the center of the galaxy. And you can see something remarkable is that um, you can measure this velocity well out past where there are any stars. You can use clouds of gas that are out there. But you see that the velocity goes to kind of a constant once you get well out past where the stars are. And this was actually something of a surprising, uh, surprising result. Uh, you can do the same kind of measurement with uh, the neutral atomic gas. So what I just described was using stars. This is a map of a different galaxy. Uh, the image is of the stars, so the black is where there's a lot of starlight, the gray is where there's less starlight. And then these contours are emission at 21 centimeters of wavelength, so that's well into the radio regime. And what's happening is that you have clouds of a neutral atomic hydrogen. And that neutral atomic hydrogen can emit light at very long wavelengths. It doesn't emit starlight, but emits other light that you can measure and you can use for these kinds of uh, speed measurements. And so people did these kinds of measurements and they saw a similar type of behavior where the velocity goes up and then it stays constant for a very, very long time. And this is happening well out past the distance where the stars run out. So a, kil a parsec is about three light years. So this is about 24,000 light years, um, this arrow. And the measurements are going all the way out to about 100,000 light years, so about the size of our own galaxy. And so you see that the velocity goes up and stays constant. So now using that equation that we saw earlier relating centripetal and gravitational force, we can either measure the mass from the velocity or predict a velocity for a certain mass. Okay, so one thing people did was, well, you see all the stars, you can count up how many stars there are, you can make some assumption about how stellar light connects to mass. You can assume that all stars weigh about the same amount as our sun. And you can predict what the mass must be as a, as a function of radius and therefore what this velocity must be. And this curve labeled disk tells you what the prediction was, that the velocity should drop like a rock once you get out past where the stars end. And so the, the observations were obviously quite different. So people postulated that there must be some additional matter that's uh, increasing as you go out to larger radius and is providing the extra m you need to keep v constant. 
Okay? Another way of looking at that is by looking at the mass enclosed. So you measure V and turn it into M. And if you just count up stars and gas, that's this disk part that stops getting bigger at around 8 kiloparsecs. But then to explain this curve, you need a mass component that keeps on going up as you go out to larger distance. And in fact, once you get out to the edge of the measurements, you need five times as much mass in the halo of the galaxy as was in the disk alone, in the stars alone. And if you go further out, it can be in fact 10 times as much. So this was early evidence that there must be something else in these galaxies to explain why the velocity uh, of rotation keeps staying constant as you go out to large radius. Okay, so Vera Rubin and her colleagues re recognized this uh, after doing many of, these many of these studies. And in fact, in 1980, they pointed out the mass is not converging to a limiting mass. The conclusion is inescapable that non-luminous matter exists beyond the optical galaxy. So this has been known for a long time. And the basic picture from there on was that you have galaxies sitting in these huge blobs of some sort of non-luminous matter. And that's the thing that actually dominates how these, things, uh, how these things are held together. It's providing all the gravity that makes the stars go around the center in circles. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about um, uh, a me a measurements on a larger scales, on the scale of galaxy clusters, which are groups of thousands of galaxies. And we're going to use a tool called gravitational lensing. So what this is a simulation of is if there was a black hole between us and the galaxy, and then the black hole is passing in front of the galaxy. And what's happening is that the, ga the galaxy is actually bending the light of the, ga uh, sorry, the black hole is bending the light of the galaxy. And at some points during that bending, you actually see a second image of the galaxy kind of turned inside out. And this here in the center is the black hole. And kind of regardless of where you are, you see a distortion. Okay, so this is bending of light by matter. You need large amounts of matter to do it, but we can use this to actually figure out how much matter is in a certain region. So this has been done for clusters of galaxies. This is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope of uh, the cluster Abel 2218. Abel was a, a, a poor guy who spent most of his thesis cataloging galaxy clusters by looking at pictures. Um, but he's actually quite famous because every cluster, uh, lots of clusters are, are called by their Abel catalog names. Um, so here's a, a cluster of galaxies. It doesn't look all that impressive when you look at just the optical light, but you can see these arcs. What those arcs are are background galaxies, things that are way behind the cluster. And the light, as it's passing, to, as coming toward us, it's being bent by the cluster and getting distorted. So what were you know, fuzzy blobs like this get stretched into these arcs by the lensing effect. And you can use this. If you have enough of these arcs, you can infer what the total mass in the cluster is and calculate the total amount of mass. And we think that you know, this effect doesn't care about what kind of mass it is, just any mass will do this bending. So you really get the total mass in the cluster by looking at these arcs. And you can do this on measurement on a lots, of, lots of galaxy clusters now. Um, one that's been done, uh, oh sorry, let me just illustrate the geometry a little better. So this is a galaxy that's right behind your cluster and here's the telescope that you're looking with. Obviously the scale is much shrunk. Um, and what happens of course is that um, as the light passes by the galaxy, instead of taking the straight line path, some paths of light get bent by the cluster and then what it looks like to you is that you see a copy of the galaxy here and here. So you can see multiple copies of the same galaxy. And also there's distortions you get, like, like we saw in the last picture. OK, so it's a very, uh, a very extreme effect in some cases. So this is a cluster called the bullet cluster where this, was, this kind of measurement was made. And remarkably enough, it was seen that there were two blobs of matter. So the blue blobs here are indicating basically the amount of total matter in the cluster as a function of position on the sky. And you can see that there's one blob here and there's one blob here. And the, the natural explanation for this is that it's actually two clusters that are merging together or have actually merged and passed through each other. Then the red here is um, it's, it's a map of X-ray emission. And what that um, emission is telling you about is the normal matter. The normal matter, when it falls into this cluster, heats up to 10 to 100 million degrees Celsius and actually emits x-rays. So x-rays are like the medical x-rays you, you've, you've taken. But just like the, the gas in the sun collapses and heats up and emits uh, light in the optical, now this gas is so hot that it's emitting light as, as x-rays. And by looking at the x-rays, we can actually figure out how much normal matter is there giving off those x-rays and also map it out. And so you see two things. First of all, there's um, a displacement between the normal matter and the total matter. The normal matter is not lined up with the total matter. So that's already interesting. And then you see these interesting structures here as if something, something has happened. 
So people have done simulations of how you could get this kind of arrangement of total matter and normal matter. And this is one of those simulations. So blue is total and or non-normal and red is normal matter. And you can see they're passing through each other. The blue parts just pass through each other and essentially are unchanged. The red parts, though, have kind of collided. And there's been some viscosity and they've slowed down a bit. And then you form this, um, this edge here due to, those, due to that collision. Let's let it pass through one more time. Yeah, so this edge here forms. And this thing becomes clearly more squashed in this direction. And it looks very much like what you see on the sky. And so the explanation for this, or at least one explanation for this, is that you've got one component, which is normal matter, and it collides. And things happen when it collides. It gets heated up. There's drag. Um, you get these kinds of fronts forming. It interacts the way normal matter should interact. But then you have a big component of stuff that doesn't interact at all. It basically just passes right through. And the only interaction is gravity, which isn't enough to tear these blobs apart. Uh, so the explanation is that this is all some sort of non-normal matter, dark matter you could call it, and then the, gr the red stuff is normal matter that we know about. And when you use the gravitational lensing data to figure out how much there is, there's about five to ten times as much of the non-normal matter as there is of the normal matter. So this is really suggestive of the same kind of thing, that you need something that's not the normal matter that we know about to explain how this thing is behaving. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what might be the candidates for this stuff. So could it be normal matter just some, in some form that we don't know about? Well, one main thing is it has to be what's called collisionless. It has to pa be able to pass through itself without having any interactions. And that's, um, it, you can't do that with normal matter. It's very hard to do that with normal matter. There are a couple of other measurements in cosmology that I'm not going to have time to talk about, but let me just mention them, that strongly indicate that the normal matter is only about one-sixth of the total amount of matter. There's one measurement, which is the abundances of light elements. We can actually go out and look in the sky and measure how much uh, helium, three helium, deuterium, and lithium there is in the universe today. And we actually understand very well how these things are produced in the early universe and can use that to figure out what the total amount of normal matter in the universe is today. And it says that it's actually about a factor of six below the amount of matter, the total matter that we measure in various ways. So that's one indication. Uh, the second is through something called the cosmic microwave background. You've, some of you have probably heard about this. So it's basically a backlight from the early universe. When the universe was young and hot, there was a soup of light uh, uh, everywhere. And then a as the universe cooled down, that soup of light kind of cooled off, but it's still coming toward us. And that, that light is actually very uniform across the entire sky. Right now it looks like uh, a body that's three degrees above absolute zero. Um, but it's uniform to a part in 10 to the 5, so very, very uniform. But there are fluctuations. And what's important is that the fluctuations are actually the seeds of all the structure that we see today. They're basically a, a baby picture of all of the structure of galaxies and galaxy clusters we see today. And you can look at the size of those fluctuations and ask, are they correct? And the problem is that the fluctuations are actually too large for them to be normal, caused by normal matter because at the time when those fluctuations formed, normal matter couldn't really collapse. Every time it would collapse, you'd get these kinds of collisions and the pressure would push the normal matter back out. So in, in some sense, they were, the fluctuations were too large. You couldn't get normal matter to clump that much. And in a different sense, the fluctuations were too small. Because if you look at those fluctuations and ask, are they big enough to evolve into the structure we see today, and you do the calculation, you find that they weren't. They're about a factor of 10 too small. So you end up with these two problems if you assume that there's only normal matter in the universe and that it was the thing that caused these fluctuations. Uh, and then there is one type of normal matter that could, could do the trick, which is primordial black holes. These would be black holes that formed very, very early in the universe and locked up normal matter in a way that it wouldn't uh, cause these problems. But it's kind of an unmotivated, uh, uh, unmotivated theory, but it's a reasonable alternative. So uh, something that we do a lot in physics is we say, well, we've got a phenomenon and we can't explain it with what we know about already, so let's hypothesize a new particle. And this is not unheard of. In fact, it's very frequently done in physics. So this is, um, this is an example from the 1930s. So this is what's called a beta decay spectrum. So what happens is when you have certain nuclei, if you wait long enough, they'll spit out an electron and one of the neutrons inside the nucleus will turn into a proton. So it'll change what kind of atom it is and an electron will come out. And what was very strange was when this phenomenon was first noticed and measured, the spectrum of the electrons coming out, the energy of the electrons, was not just one value. You see only two particles in this process, and so if you conserve energy and momentum, the uh, electron should only come out with one particular value of the energy up at the top of the uh, edge here. 
But in fact, you came out with this big spectrum of energies. And so this wasn't understood. And so people thought, oh, do we have to abandon conservation of energy and momentum? That's a terrible thing to have to give up, but maybe we need to. Uh, so Wolfgang Pauli actually came up with a different solution. And I don't know if you can read all this, but I'll try to read parts of it. <laughs> Uh, so, dear radioactive ladies and gentlemen, so he's writing a letter to a conference uh, that he's not able to attend. I've hit upon a desperate remedy to save the law of conservation of energy. There could exist electrically neutral particles, which I will call neutrons, in the nuclei. Later, they came to be called neutrinos. Uh, continuous beta spectrum would then make sense with the assumption that in beta decay, in addition to the electron, a neutron is emitted. But so far, I, dare, I do not dare to publish anything about this idea and trustfully turn first to you with the question of how likely it is to find experimental evidence. I admit that my remedy may seem almost improbable because one probably would have seen those neutrons if they exist for a long time, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. So he proposed this idea of what came to be called the neutrino. And in fact, it took 30 years for the neutrino to actually be physically discovered. But you know, it, it was a situation where you could either give up a very important principle, conservation of energy and momentum, or you could hypothesize a new particle. And hypothesizing the new particle was the less terrible option, and it turned out to be the right option. So we can do that. Now, there's another way of, of approaching the problem, which is to say, what if we actually don't have the physics right? What if we've been making an approximation all along, and we need to fix the approximation? And this is actually kind of one of the ways you can look at general relativity. So I won't, expl I won't explain general relativity in, in one hour, but let me give you a, a flavor of how it came about, or why, it, why, why it's, it's, a, it's an improvement over what we have. So when you look at basic physics, you have F equals MA. So force equals mass times acceleration. Newton you know, wrote this law down in the 1700s. And he also wrote down the law of gravitation. F equals GMM over R squared, two masses M and M. This works in most situations that we're aware of. It works in almost all situations that we're aware of. But it turns out it's a bad approximation when this ratio is comparable to the speed of light squared. So basically, when you have situations with a lot of mass in a really small area, when M over R is big. And that's when uh, Newtonian physics, Newtonian gravitation breaks down, and you need general relativity, which says that objects curve space-time, and then particles follow straight paths through that curved space-time. So light gets bent because of that. So that was a case where we actually saw that what we knew up until that point was only an approximation that failed in some extreme regime that only, um, only now we're actually be able to, we're begin, becoming able to see. So there's been a suggestion of a similar type that actually F equals MA is only an approximation. And that in some regimes, when the accelerations are very small, it changes to this form, where there's a function that goes to 1 at accelerations that we see every day. But it's a function that goes to A over A naught for accelerations that are important on, gra on cosmological scales, on, on the scales of our galaxy. And this would actually explain the rotation curves. It would say that you need less gravitational force to keep things moving in a circle than we thought you did. So it's, you know, it's a plausible explanation, and people have been trying to test this explanation. And it, it does not appear to be as good of an explanation as dark matter, but it continues to live on because you can, you can fit it to certain amounts of the data. OK, but like I'm, I'm going to concentrate in this talk on dark matter candidates and the par possible particles, because these are things that we can really go out and try to detect. So let's think about, well, what does a dark matter particle candidate have to do? Well, first of all, you have to have a lot of them, right? They dominate the universe. There, there really ought to be a lot of them. So it has to be able to be produced very in, in a great abundance in the early universe. It has to be massive enough to be slow today. Because if you have um, dark matter particles around today that are moving too quickly, if they're moving near the speed of light or even a good fraction of the speed of light, they don't clump together to form galaxies and galaxy clusters. You have to get them to clump together if they're going to be the dominant mass. Uh, they have to obviously interact very weakly with normal matter. You saw that whole business of the two blobs passing through each other and also not having any effect on the, on the normal matter. So they need to not interact with normal matter and with itself, except through gravity, obviously. Uh, whatever it is, it has to be stable so it doesn't, it doesn't decay. And it turns out that there, this, this gives you a, f a set of properties that are fairly uh, simple to talk about. You need something that's roughly 10 to 1,000 proton masses uh, in, in mass for the particle. It can interact via something called the weak force. Uh, this is the force that actually controls nuclear decay. It's the thing that causes beta decay. It can interact by that force and gravity, but no other ones. Because if it interacted by other ones, we would have already seen it. And it has to make up about 5, 6 of the dark matter today. So this kind of particle for about 30 years has been called a WIMP, or weakly interacting massive particle, because it's weakly interacting and massive. Um, uh, so it's a good name, right? <laughs> OK, so the question is, should this thing exist? And not 
not in the standard model. So there's a standard model of particle physics which lists all the particles we know about plus one that we hope to find, the Higgs boson, and it's not in there. Um, but there are models that explain the standard model that would also provide dark matter particles. There's something called supersymmetry which says there's actually a partner for every particle we know about and one of those could be the dark matter particle in fact. Um, and this is getting tested right now. So you know, there's, a, there's a hope that in the next uh, few years we'll actually make these things in the lab if they really do exist. So uh, there's something of a prediction by, by no means a certain prediction for such a particle. Okay, so now how do you actually go about detecting these things? Okay, so uh, certainly we expect them to dominate the halo of our galaxy. They have to, otherwise they wouldn't, we wouldn't have noticed them yet in terms of their gravity. So they'd have a mass of around 100 proton masses, give or take a factor of 10, which in astronomy is not that big of a factor. Uh, and the speed they have to have, this one's actually known pretty well because they have to behave in the same way that the matter in our galaxy behaves, at least in terms of the speed that they move at. So that's about 300 kilometers per second or about one one thousandth of the speed of light. Now particles that are this massive move this slowly actually are really boring. They just scatter like billiard balls off of nuclei. Uh, they just bump into them and bounce off. Um, so the typical energy deposited you can calculate, you know, a typical nucleus actually is around the same mass as this. You can figure out how much energy gets deposited and it's about the same as a medical x-ray, tens of keV. It's not very much energy and the rate you know, in order for us not to have noticed them to date would be very, very small, 0.01 per kilogram per day. So if I have a kilogram of target material sitting there, it has 10 to the 26 nuclei in it uh, and I watch it for 100 days, I'll see one interaction. Okay, so that's weak, right? Um, so that's the, the, the kind of thing that we're looking for. Now they would scatter off electrons but it's the same thing as if you th throw a tennis ball at a wall. The tennis ball bounces off, it didn't gain energy, it didn't lose energy, it just changed direction. The same kind of thing would happen with an electron running into a nucleus because the electron is so much lighter than the nucleus. The electron doesn't get much energy and so you would never be able to detect those scatters. So we're looking for interactions with nuclei depositing very small amounts of energy. Okay, so why is this hard? Well, the rates are really low. So if you just think about how radioactive your own body is, okay, what you think to be a very uh, clean and pure thing, it's full of radioactivity. Uh, 10 million decays per day, you know, for the typical 50 to 70 kilogram person. Um, and that's due to two elements that are just naturally present, potassium 40 and carbon 14. And this actually is more energy than we expect WIMPs to, WIMPs to deposit. The earth itself is terribly radioactive due to uranium and thorium in the crust and in the mantle and also radon that emanates out of the ground due to these things sitting inside the rock. And then constantly, we're being constantly bombarded by particles from outer space. They're hitting the top of the atmosphere and creating showers of particles that come down to the ground. And those are passing through us constantly. And these things are all going to hit any detector that you build to try to look for WIMPs. So that's one problem. Uh, the energy depositions are very low, uh, but because of low rate you also need big detectors. So you need to be able to sense very small energy depositions in huge massive detectors. And then you need a way to separate these nuclear recoils, the things that run into nuclei from most of the backgrounds, most of the other particles that hit your detector which will hit electrons. If you have a way to separate the two then you can hope to look for, hope to look for WIMPs. Okay. So what are some good materials to use? Uh, semiconductors actually turn out to be really good because so much work has gone into purifying them for the semiconductor industry. Uh, they're very clean materials, silicon and germanium. Silicon, silic silicon, not silicone, not the stuff you use to cock your tub. Um, liquefied noble gases are also very good. Uh, noble, li noble elements are chemically inert for the most part. They don't bind with other things. So it's quite easy to purify them. So things like neon, argon and xenon, if you cool them down cold enough, they turn into liquids and you get a, a lot of it, uh, you know, kilograms to tens of kilograms to hundreds of kilograms of these as your target. Copper is a very good shielding material uh, because you can separate out the uranium and thorium through the process that you make the copper, especially if you electroform it. You plate it out on an electrode that really pulls the copper out without sucking the uranium and thorium with it. Lead is a really clean element. It tends to, in the process of smelting the lead, separating the lead from the ore, the uranium and thorium also gets left behind. You're stuck with one nasty isotope called lead 210 that's actually a daughter of the uranium and thorium that was in the ore, but it has only a 22 year half life. So what people do is they look for old lead. They look for lead that was in the ballast of ships from the 1600s and 1700s. It's been under the water for you know, hundreds of years. They look for Roman plumbing and you know, basically melt it down and make their shields out of this old lead. And so there's a lot of, uh, there, are, there are shady deals made sometimes to acquire this stuff. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I don't know where our leads come from. 
Okay, so uh, plastics are good. Some plastics are good. You can get pl plastics that are very clean, you know, primarily because you know where all the elements that went into it came from. And then water, if purified well and stored in a container that itself is, is low radioactivity, is also a great material for shielding. So these are, these are the ten things that we tend to try to build our experiments out of. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about how our detectors work. And as I mentioned before, we want to separate nuclear recoils, interactions of WIMPs with nuclei, from interactions of other stuff with electrons. And these are actually very different beats. If you put tens of keV into a nucleus, it only moves off at about one one-thousandth of the speed of light. It kind of lumbers along like a Mack truck through your target. And it only moves tens of, uh, tens of nanometers, so tens, tens of, uh, of billionths of a meter. Whereas electrons pick up a good fraction of the speed of light, and they'll go many millionths of a meter in your target. So the amount of energy deposited would be the same, but in one case it's all concentrated in a very small ball, and in the other case it's spread out over a much larger region. So if you can figure out a way to tell apart dense and sparse energy depositions, then you have a way to separate WIMP interactions causing nuclear recoils from, electron, uh, from background interactions causing electron recoils. Now, neutrons also interact with nuclei, so you have to find a way to get rid of your neutrons, but you can, there are ways to shield against neutrons, and we, we, of course, do that. Okay, so to kind of indicate what the problems are, we've seen that you need to be able to detect very low energy depositions. You need to have lots of mass and look at it for a long time. Uh, you have to control backgrounds very well um, by cleanliness, you know, minimizing the amount of material around and then shielding against it, both passively by actively detecting it if it's there, and then most importantly, or well, most critically for, our, for most of these experiments, you go deep underground because all of these cosmic ray particles that are hitting us above ground, if you go just a few tens of meters underground, you'll get rid of most of them. And then as you go deeper, the rate of such particles goes down very, very quickly. So you want to go as deep as you can uh, to build these experiments. And then you want to be able to tell nuclear recoils from electron recoils. So the signatures of a, of a WIMP event would be nuclear, it'd have to be a nuclear recoil, and you'd not see a double scatter. You wouldn't see it interact twice because WIMPs already interact so rarely. Okay, so now let me tell you about how we, uh, in our experiment, go about doing this, uh, solving this problem. So we actually use sound to detect dark matter. The idea is that interactions of pretty much any particle in a target will cause acoustic vibrations or, or sound. In fact, most of the energy goes into sound, and if you can detect that, you can actually measure very small energy depositions. And um, what's nice also is that it's sort of a calorimetric measurement. It measures the total energy deposited regardless of how dense or sparse the energy deposition was. So it tells you the total energy uh, independent of the type of particle. So these detectors were developed at Blas Cabrera's group at Stanford here and then at Bernard Satellite's group in Berkeley. And so let me tell you how they work. Uh, we first start off with a substrate that's roughly a quarter kilogram of silicon or germanium, and we cool it down to about 40 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero, so well below one degree above absolute zero. And you have to do that because there are also thermal vibrations that will wash out the acoustic vibrations that are caused by your interaction. So you have to go to a low enough temperature where you can hear your event above the noise of the thermal uh, vibration. So you have to be very cold. Um, the second step is that when a particle interacts, it creates sound waves, and those things propagate through the crystal, just like my voice is propagating through the room, except they move a lot faster, about a centimeter per microsecond. Uh, my voice moves at about a centimeter per millisecond or so, or centimeter per 10 milliseconds, so much, much faster than in air. And then what we do is on the surface of the detector, we have films of aluminum that are well below their superconducting transition. So the superconducting transition is where the electrons, when you go below that temperature, they actually pair up. And they like to be in pairs. And in fact, when you're below that temperature, that pairing makes, them have, ha, makes the material have no resistance electrically. Now, it's not so much that that's important here. What's important here is the fact that they pair up. Uh, because we use that. When the sound waves hit that aluminum, they actually break the pairs. And so what we want to do is we want to detect how many of these broken pairs there are around when we have a particle interaction in the substrate. And so we have a thin thermometer here on the edge, and there's, things are set up so that the electrons want to go into the thermometer. And the thermometer itself is another superconductor. It's a superconductor that's now in the middle of its transition from superconducting to normal. So its resistance goes from perfectly zero to some non-zero value. And we sit somewhere here in the middle. And so if energy goes into that, the resistance changes a lot, and we can see that. We can, make that me we can measure that change. And that change is telling us about how much sound came in from the substrate. Uh, so this is the basic idea of how our detectors work. 
so this is what they look like. Uh, so these have been these were manufactured by at um, at the Sanford Nanofab facility down on campus. Paul Brink, one of the guys who has made them in the past, is here. Uh, so 7.5 centimeters across uh, versus one centimeter thick silicon or germanium. You can see the aluminum sensor here on the surface. This is a close up of an older version where uh, again here are the aluminum pieces. Those are the, place, the places where the sound comes in and breaks the pairs to make free electrons. And then you can see the very narrow tungsten thermometer on the edge. So this is uh, you know, hundreds of microns, a fraction of a millimeter and this is only one thousandth of a millimeter in, in width. The sensor is segmented into four different pieces and we read out the four pieces separately. And that's neat, interesting because again this whole sound analogy works very well is that those are like four microphones picking up the sound of an event. So just like if you clashed cymbals in the center of a room and had four microphones and you could measure the amount of sound and the time that the sound arrived, you can reconstruct the position of the cymbals. The same thing happens here. So this is a display of an experiment we did where we had a, a large chunk of metal in front of the detector and then we put a radioactive source on the other side and there were eight holes in that chunk of metal. So the, the particles from the radioactive source would only go through in those eight places. And we can actually reconstruct the position of those eight places using how the energy is shared between the four different sensors. So this is basically left, right versus top, bottom. And then also using the relative time of arrival of the sound energy at the four sensors. So this is again left, right and top, bottom. And this is time in microseconds. So by looking at this you know, a few microsecond time delays, you can see where these holes are and where the event actually occurred. Okay? So you can reconstruct position in these detectors using the sound that was created when a particle interacted. Now the other measurement we do, and this is actually a very important one, is that we have to also figure out a way to tell what type of particle it was, right? what type of recoil it was. The sound measurement just tells you total energy. It doesn't tell you what kind of particle it was. So what we do is we apply an electric field. Okay? We, we actually put a, a, a voltage, three volts, so basically two AA batteries across the, the, the flat surfaces of the detector. And when a particle interacts, it not only creates sound, uh, the nucleus or the electron that recoils, it's charged. It's either a big ball of a nuclear, it's a big nucleus that has many positive charges or it's an electron that has one negative charge. And when that thing zips off through the target material, it actually rips electrons off of all the atoms in the target material. So you have all these free electrons floating around and you also have the vacancies left behind by them. So those are called holes. And when you have this happen in an electric field, the electrons go in one direction and the holes go in the other direction and you can actually use an amplifier to collect those electrons and holes and measure how many of these were created. And it turns out that the, the number is different for the nuclear recoils that WIMPs would cause and the electron recoils that we expect most background particles would cause. So that's shown here. Basically this vertical axis is the ratio of the charge collected to the acoustic signal and then this is the total energy basically measured by the acoustic signal. Uh, these are interactions with electrons. So these are electron recoils. These are background. And then these are interactions with neutrons which look like interactions with WIMPs. So this is what our signal would look like. So you can see that there's a very clear way to separate the nuclear recoils from WIMPs from the electron recoils from background. Okay? So this is the key aspect of the experiment is to be able to make that separation. Okay? And I'll explain these black dots in a second. Uh, let me just note that this disk like detector is actually separated into two pieces. One is an inner region and an outer region and we discard the events in the outer region because things don't work so well out there. So then we have these black events. These black events actually are um, electron recoils but they're happening near the surface and for reasons I won't go into, the charge signal ends up being off for some reason. But with the sound signal you can do a remarkable thing. You can actually tell where the events were vertically to. So what this is, these two plots are showing you is what the actual sound signals look like. So this is basically, you can think of it as sound as a function of time where now time is in microseconds, so millionths of a, of a second. And it's showing you different shapes of these pulses for different kinds of events. The fastest events are the ones where you have an electron recoil near the surface. The next slower events are electron recoils in the bulk of the crystal, so away from the surfaces. And then the slowest ones are nuclear recoils. Okay? So you can actually tell the, the type of recoil it was by the shape of the phonon signal. Um, and so that's shown here in this plot where now I have the same vertical axis. Again, it's charge over acoustic signal. So here are the bulk electron recoils and here are the WIMP nuclear recoils. But now I have the acoustic arrival time on the horizontal axis instead of energy. And so you can see that things that would look like WIMPs not only have low value of this ratio but they're also slow. Okay? So WIMPs are low charge to acoustic ratio and slow. Everything else is fast and higher charge to acoustic ratio. So that's basically how we do the experiment is we make plots like this and say are there any events out here? 
okay? But I'll, I'll take you through it in a bit more detail. It's a bit more involved than that. Okay, so the experiment itself is um, called the cryogenic dark matter search. Um, it was I, something of the least common denominator name. Many other more inventive names were, were come up with. Um, it's sited at the Sudan mine in northern Minnesota. So this is a former um, iron mine that's been in uh, a state park in Minnesota for decades. Um, this is what it looks like in the winter. So this is the hoist that you go in to go down underground. The mine itself is 2,300 feet underground, which is the equivalent of having two kilometers of water above you. So I mentioned before how water is a good shield. We measure our shielding in the amount of equivalent water it would be. And so that stops most of the cosmic rays that are hitting the top, hitting the ground. Uh, and we ran about five kilograms of germanium and one kilogram of silicon detectors there uh, for two years during the final data set. So that was the tail end of this, um, this, this time. Uh, I'm not going to read off all the names, but this is the large number of people that are involved in the experiment. You can see it's, uh, you know, it's a complicated experiment that requires uh, many different groups with a lot of different expertise. And I'll just note the local, uh, the local contributors are Stanford, uh, Berkeley, Santa Clara, and then uh, Slack has just joined recently in the last couple of years and is helping us with the next generation of the experiment. And uh, we're supported by uh, the DOE, high energy physics, and also by the National Science Foundation. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of a tour of how detectors that we build here in the Bay Area get from here to the mine and into the, into the experiment. So they get put into a big crate and put on a big truck that drives across the country. We actually don't want to put them on planes because uh, they can get to some extent contaminated by being that high up in the atmosphere. So we put them on a truck and, and our um, technician from Minnesota comes here and drives the truck back. It's hoisted off the truck and into the, into the uh, hoist to go down into the mine. Once it comes down into the mine, a smaller box is taken out of the big box. And then out of the smaller box comes another smaller box. This is now polyethylene. This is another uh, precaution against getting the detectors contaminated as they travel across the country. I won't explain in detail why. Inside the smaller box is another smaller box. This time, this is a vacuum vessel that's filled up with very pure nitrogen gas uh, so that the detectors can, can't get contaminated along the way. And then finally, we go inside of a clear room and get to open the box up. And so this little thing took an entire you know, uh, semi-truck to go across the country. Um, it's wasteful, but compared to the cost of the experiment, it's not that expensive. Um, so uh, this, is the, this is a stack of six detectors. You're not actually seeing the detectors here. You're seeing uh, some of the readout electronics components at the top. Um, when we get there, we check to make sure it survived the trip across the country. This is our project manager, Dan Bauer. And then it goes into another box for safekeeping for a little while. And then eventually, um, a lucky graduate student or faculty member get to stick the thing into the cryostat, which is shown here. Uh, they're, all, uh, uh, they're all in clean garb because we, again, have to keep the experiment clean, prevent stuff from getting in that we don't want to get in. And here you can see those uh, two stacks of detectors inserted into the cryostat. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Okay, so this is what the experiment looks like close up. It's actually hard to get a good picture of the whole thing because it's in a clean room that's not much bigger than the experiment, so you can't get a really good panoramic view. Uh, but over here is a commercial refrigerator that cools you down to well below one degree Kelvin. So that's what provides the cold. And then we built a customized cryostat all out of mostly pure copper uh, for radioactivity uh, reasons. And that sits over here and it's connected to the fridge through this leg here. And then surrounding that cryostat is a whole bunch of shielding. We have first some polyethylene, so that stops neutrons. Then we have some of that ancient lead. Then we have normal lead outside of it. Then we have more polyethylene, again, to stop more neutrons. And then outside of the whole thing, there's what's called a, a veto detector. It tells us if any of those rare cosmic rays that actually get down to this depth, it tells us if they pass through the experiment. And obviously, we want to ignore events that happen when those things pass through. Um, and then if you look from above, this is the full set of detectors. There's five stacks of six detectors each, so 30 detectors in the final experiment. And this whole thing sits at 40 millikelvin. Okay, so now you run the experiment for two years, and that's a not boring aspect, but not very interesting to explain. It basically involves watching the experiment, make sure nothing's going wrong, making sure that the data quality is as good as it can be, and so that when you finally have your data set, you have something that's good for analyzing. <clears throat> okay, so then we move on to the actual analysis, and this is conceptually pretty straightforward. So we have this plot, again, of charge over acoustic signal versus total energy. And we want to look for events down here where nuclear recoils would be, and we want them to be slow timing, right? But we don't want to find things just because we want to find things. So we do something called blinding. We actually take all the events that are in this region before we know whether they're nuclear recoils or not, and we put them aside. We mask them out. Um, so this is called blinding. Uh, it basically is to avoid biasing ourselves. 
But because you also don't have the ability to check whether you've made any mistakes, it frequently feels like this. Uh, but you know we've done the we've done analyses on subsets of data, so we it's it's not feeling so much like this that much anymore. Uh, it felt like that the first time. Okay, so then how do we go about doing this? Well, you hire lots of postdocs and graduate students who they do most of the work. You know, the 40 to 80 hours a week it takes to do an analysis like this. They're the ones who are trying to figure out how do we, what's the best way to identify a WIMP candidate in the presence of all the other stuff hitting the detector? And you can see there's lots of other stuff hitting the detector. Okay, so we, we go through all that process, which is slow and arduous, but uh, very important. And then finally, we get to look in this region. So let me just remind you again what we're looking for. So remember, the events that we're looking for are like these blue events. They have to have low charge over acoustic signal ratio, and they have to have a slow arrival time. This is a different plot. This is that ratio, but now versus energy. And remember, we've masked out this area, and right now you're only looking at events that have fast uh, timing. So you're looking at all the events that aren't going to be WIMPs. So we look at this, we finally open up this mast region. We ask, is the number of events there the amount that we expected? This is just like a test. It's not actually important for the WIMP search, but it lets us understand, are we making, are we correct in the way we're predicting what events go from here down into here? And it turned out, yeah, it was about right. It's about 150 events. We expected about 100, but this was not an unusual fluctuation. And then finally, we, instead of looking at this side of the plot, we look at this side of the plot. We look at the slow events. And we saw two events very down near the threshold. The dashed line is where we stop analyzing data. But that's not enough to say that we've seen WIMPs. We expected about 0.8 events and we saw two. So that's not a particularly unusual fluctuation. That happens about, expected to be happen about 23% of the time. So we can't claim a detection, but we can say we've constrained dark matter in some way. And the way we do that is we make this kind of a plot. So let me take a minute to explain this plot and what it's telling you. So along the horizontal axis is the possible mass of a WIMP. And this is basically in proton masses, so 10, 100, 1,000. This vertical axis is telling you how frequently the WIMPs interact with um, normal matter. And it's a funny way of, of talking about it, but it literally is if you're a WIMP coming in and you see a nucleon, so a proton or a neutron in a nucleus, this is what the effective area of that particle looks like. So it's a really small number, 10 to the minus 42 square centimeters, 10 to the minus 43 square centimeters. It's hard to even imagine how big that number is. For example, uh, or for reference, a typical nucleus is around 10 to the minus uh, 13 centimeters across, so roughly 10 to the minus 26 centimeters squared. So this is almost 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the size of a typical nucleus. So that tells you how unlikely it is for a WIMP to interact with a particle in a nucleus. And then what we do is we draw a curve like this that says that models that would predict a rate above that curve are not allowed by our data. They would have predicted more events than we saw. Whereas if a, if a number, if a model is down here with a lower WIMP nucleon cross section, then it's a model that's allowed by our data. It would have seen less events than we saw. So these solid curves are basically the, re, the, the boundary between things that are excluded and things that are allowed. Models that are excluded and models that are allowed. This was the data set we just analyzed. This is in combination with previous data, and this is how well we would have expected to do on average. So the most important thing is that these are these various blobs here, because no one knows what the real WIMP model is or whether there is even a WIMP model. There's you know, a lot of freedom in it, but people make predictions of what's a reasonable range of WIMP models. And these blobs are telling you different people's versions of what's a reasonable range. And the critical thing is that you know, we're excluding lots of these models. We're testing models of what WIMPs should look like and saying, no, that can't be right. Whereas these ones down here, they're still allowed. Okay? So we're making progress in identifying whether WIMPs can be real or not. Uh, these, other dash, uh, these other various curves are, are limits from other experiments. And you can see that everybody's within a, you know, a good fraction of an order of magnitude. So there's a very competitive field with different technologies being used uh, to try to study and look for WIMPs. So let me uh, just tell you a little bit about the future. So um, there are other experiments, and they're making very good progress too. So at the time, we had uh, the best limit in the world over most of the mass range. And now another experiment called Xenon 100 has uh, improved on our limit. So the, previous, the thing you just saw in the previous plot is this red line here. So they're um, a factor of a few below us. We're starting a new sta a stage of our experiment right now called Super CDMS Sudan that we hope will get down below there or detect something in the meantime. And then there's various generations in the future of both experiments and other experiments going to uh, a ton of xenon and 100 to 1,500 kilograms of germanium eventually. 
Um, this blob here is what some people think would, is the current allowed region for supersymmetry now that the LHC has been taking data and people have tried to search for supersymmetry at the LHC. This is, with a base, this is with some set of assumptions that you have to be careful about. It's very constrained and it may not be that those set of assumptions are right. But you can also see that we're in the, we're in the regime where we're going to be able to probe through that and test that entire region in the next few years. So it's a particularly exciting time uh, looking for WIMPs and we should be able to get down to these next two to three orders of magnitude over the next 10 to 15 years. Okay, so let me conclude by saying that hopefully I've convinced you that dark matter provides a, a compelling explanation for many astronomical observations and it might make up five, six of the matter in the universe. That we can actually test whether dark matter is made of a new particle by experiments we're doing here on Earth. And while it's technically challenging, we're making good progress and hopefully between us and the LHC we'll be able to see WIMPs in the next few years. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks so much, Daniel. So we'll have time for uh, um, some questions and some answers. Uh, for the people that are not an, uh, asking a question at the moment, please fill out the survey in front of you. It helps us a ton, sort of improve the whole series. Okay, who's got the first question? Okay, right over here. Yeah, hi. In the press recently has been some uh, suggestions of neutrinos that, are, that may be traveling faster than the speed of light oh, right. in, in, from Geneva to Italy. Uh, what, first of all, what do you think of those? And secondly, what impact, if any, would they have in, on these theories? So what do I think of it? Um, I took a quick look at the paper and it doesn't appear they've done anything obviously wrong. And they're being actually very <laughs> open about the data and what they're seeing. So it's weird and I don't think anybody has an explanation for it. But at least they're, they're being pretty clear about what they've seen and they're waiting for other experiments to see whether they see the same thing or not. So it's, it's just really hard to say anything one way or another about it. It's an interesting result that people have to check. Uh, as far as whether it has any effect here, um, in the micro world, no, it doesn't have any effect. But macroscopically, if things can move faster than the speed of light, yeah, it has a huge effect, right? It completely, it's kind of at the level of general relativity or even worse um, it, in terms of uh, you know, changing how, what, what the right theory is, right? Because everything we say up to date says that there can't be anything that moves faster than the speed of light. So. That's yeah. about the best I think we can say right now. Professor, we can add real quick that actually there was the supernova in 1987. Yes, yes, that, that already set a constraint that's much tighter than this, right? Yeah, because there we were lucky enough that a neutrino detector was online and so you saw the optical light from the supernova and in Japan we actually saw the neutrinos coming in. So you knew exactly the time delay, how they came in and since the distance is so much larger, um, you have very good constraints of how fast they go. And so that's actually not quite consistent at the moment, but it's different energies of the neutrinos. But so all of a sudden now it would be depend on the energy. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's weird. Uh, we're hoping it's going to go away. Yeah, that, that constraint, <laughs> the, the supernova constraint was something like a factor of 10,000 better than what's been measured. So you really have to invoke something energy dependent to explain it. Oh, there in the very back. Oh, <laughs> get some exercise for the microphone. Oh, it's one further back and you take your next, yeah. Um, how exactly do black holes help you in the research of dark matter? Um, not directly. I mean, if um, <clears throat> there, there are a few different possibilities. So in terms of looking directly for dark matter in our local neighborhood, they don't have much, they don't have any effect. But uh, there are people even here, here at Slack, in fact, who try to look for dark matter actually annihilating in the center of the galaxy, so dark matter particles running into each other and turning into other particles that we can see. And much of that could be driven by if there's a big increase in density of dark matter at the center of the galaxy because there's a big black hole there. That could be important. So indirectly it might have some effect, but not directly. Thank you. Okay, so uh, two rows in the front. First the one gentleman on the side and then we have two young physicists on the left. Next. Just here first. Oh, just behind you. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask. Um, it seemed as though the whole discussion was about WIMPs, other than you know one generalization of the uh, the law of gravity. At one time, I had the impression there were a lot of other theories. You know, machos. There were all kinds of you know acronyms. Has the discussion of dark matter really converged only on 
weakly interacting massive particles at this point? No. I, I just didn't have time to talk about all of them. But for example, machos, <clears throat> they were searched for. So machos are what are believed to be substellar objects that are dark. They, they're not big enough to start burning and, and give off light, but might be occupying our halo. They're massive compact halo objects. They were searched for in the 90s and to a large extent excluded. And also this argument about the total number of baryons in the universe says that the machos can't make up a large amount of the dark matter. Other people are looking for something called the axion that I didn't have time to talk about. But it's a very different kind of dark matter particle and it's something that's very much worthwhile looking for. We just didn't have time to talk about it. And there's lots of other, uh, there, particle physics are very creative and many, many more categories of dark matter have been proposed and there are not nearly enough experiments to look for them all. Okay, so we've got two young physicists in the same row on the end at, by the wall. I'm going to pass it through. <laughs> all right, proto-physicist. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> well, my first question is, how was dark matter formed and when was it formed exactly? Well, we don't know for sure, but it's, it's believed that dark matter would have been created in the very early universe, in, in, in fact, before the first three seconds, in the first fraction of a second. And it was just created out of the thermal bath of energy, just like all the other particles that are around now are created. And but we don't know for sure. would people be able to survive if there's no dark matter? Would we be able to survive if there was no dark matter? It's very possible we would not be here if there was no dark matter. And it's do believe... scientists form new theories every day? Um, <laughs> Oh, gee, I love it. Wait, Only if you are a theorist. My, should I ask my question? <laughs> Why is dark energy dark? Because <laughs> if it was light, we'd see it. Yeah, those are excellent questions. Okay. I have uh, another that's... question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you get one more. I like it's fast. Um, hey? wait, um, one more. Is it, is it harmless? Dark matter or dark energy? Is it radioactive? Dark matter or dark energy? Um, dark matter. We don't think it's radioactive. Okay. Okay, great. Excellent questions. Uh, do things. <laughs> nice. All right. Who else we got? This side of the house? Anybody? Okay, right here at the. This is all cold dark matter. There's been an article about warm dark matter, which is more than a million times the second Can we detect it with the Large Hadron Collider? And hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can you talk about the difference between cold dark matter and warm dark matter? Right, okay. So it's possible that the dark matter is not as heavy as we think it is in, in the searches that we're doing. So right now we're talking about dark matter that's 10 to 1,000 proton masses. It's possible that it's even a fraction of a proton mass, milli, uh, me mega electron volts. And there are prospects for such dark matter in supersymmetry theories. And they'd be very, very hard to detect because um, they don't interact nearly as strongly as the dark matter that we're looking for now, which already interacts very weakly. Uh, there are some possibilities that it could be produced at the LHC. Basically, you produce some very massive particle that eventually decays down to the warm dark matter. And people are trying to, there, it's proposed that you do searches where you look for something that exits the collider, but then at some point later interacts or decays. So there are people who are interested in looking for it. It's just, it's even harder than what we're trying to do. I seem to have read that uh, recently they also detected some WIMPs in a tunnel uh, in, Ital in Italy, just recently. Oh, it's, been, it's been detected in a tunnel in Italy many times. Um, <laughs> no, but they actually, they actually were able to detect some, something that looks like WIMPs as well? Yeah, so there, there are two different experiments that have claimed to detect uh, WIMPs in that tunnel. Um, one of them actually has, there was a claim back in 1997 where they, I didn't have time to talk about this, but because of our motion around the, the Earth's motion around the sun and the sun's motion around the center of the galaxy, we actually expect the rate of WIMP interactions to go up and down a few percent by, depending on time of year. So there's one experiment that's been claiming to see that signal for actually more than a decade. And they definitely see this thing go up and down. It's just not clear whether it's WIMPs or not. And then there's another experiment that's recently they, they see a lot of events and they can explain some of them with known backgrounds, but they're claiming that some of what they see can't be explained by known backgrounds and it could be WIMPs. But I think that claim is much weaker. I mean, yeah. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so getting back to the detection methodology, uh, you emphasized very heavily that WIMPs would interact with um, uh, nuclei but not electrons. 
and most background would interact with electrons. I can understand lighter background particles would tend to interact with electrons, but can you say more about why that's such a powerful differentiator? Well, you can see in some of the plots that the separation between where the nuclear recoils would lie, so let me split back. Um, here. So if you ignore the black points for a minute, which are kind of a different effect, uh, the separation between these events and these events is remarkably good. The, uh, the possibility that one of these would accidentally get down here is something like one part in 10 to the 6 or less. So that's really, really important is that you have a lot of these events, these kinds of events hitting your detector. It's very hard to reduce that background below a certain level, but as long as you can reject them with great, with great confidence, then you can run your experiment. So that, that's a very important rejection to be able to do. I, I, does that answer your question? I'm not sure. Is it, uh, perhaps you were sort of curious, like, why a WIMP uh, has a hard time hitting an electron and why it you know, gets more at the nuclei of, of these atoms. So, uh, so there's actually the probability for a WIMP to hit electron relative to the probability for a WIMP to hit a nucleus is actually not that much lower. It's basically a factor of roughly uh, 100 squared, about 10,000. So it's not ridiculously much lower. But there's also this kinematic thing, which is just a classical physics effect that you can't give very much energy between a, from a WIMP to an electron. And so you wouldn't be able to detect the energy for an electron recoil. That's why we built, that's why we try to shield everything else away and try to show that if we see a signal, it's not due to anything else. But yeah, it's always possible that there's some background that you didn't know about. Uh, uh, one question here in the back, I think, yeah? Can you say a word about how dark energy fits into this, system, in, in, into this uh, problem? It's not directly relevant for our searches. I mean, of course, it has an effect in that we think that the universe is about <clears throat> three-fourths dark energy, and then of the, remainder, or of the remaining one-fourth, about five-sixths of that is dark matter. So it affects the overall amount of dark matter. Uh, indirect, so it indirectly determines how much dark matter there is. But in terms of uh, how does it affect these searches, it doesn't really have any direct effect. Dark energy's kind of scale of influence is so much larger than the scale of our galaxy that it's not, too impo not particularly important locally. So we have one question over here. Right there. So I'm curious, uh, you said when you were running your experiment, you expected only 0.1 or 0.8 events to occur during the two year period. And I'm also then wondering what was their signal to noise ratio that you had for your experiment with such a tiny little expected event? So the 0.8 is the expected background. So it's basically these events and these events that might be misidentified as the green type of events. So we do calibration data sets to determine what's the chance that you're going to misidentify a background event as a WIMP event. And that's where the 0.8 comes from. Now, in terms of how many WIMP events we would have seen, that depends on the cross-section that we don't know. But like I was saying, some cross-sections would have predicted 10, 100 events. And some cross-sections would have predicted much less than one event. So we can only say something about the cross-sections that would have predicted more than a couple events. And that's where, that's where our curve lies, is around there. So let me do one more question down here at the moment. And um, while we get the microphone there, let me alert you. There's a number of people with red hats um, that are going to be around that you can also bug more about the experiment. Um, and we'll close with that question. Um, if ordinary matter is sucked into a black hole, uh, characteristically, you get radiation, high energy x-rays and such, which we have detected. Uh, would you be able to detect the interaction as dark matter was sucked into a black hole? Would it produce high levels of weak emissions or something that could be detected? That's a good question. So the, the primary way in which we see matter emitting as it gets sucked into a black hole is not actually the process of going into the black hole, but it's because you get a bi big disk of matter that gets heated up around the black hole, right? And that hot disk gives off lots and lots of x-rays and particles get ejected out of it. So they're not actually, it's not actually the process of the particle going into the black hole that's causing most of that emission. It's mostly the kind of, the stuff that happens on the way. Now in terms of the particles actually going into the black hole, I don't think you're going to, I mean, 
I might be wrong here, but I don't think you actually see much emission from that. And so you wouldn't expect to see much from the dark matter being absorbed into a black hole either. Most of that's coming from just the heating up of the material as it flows in. It's kind of the, similar to the way in which the gas in galaxy clusters heats up and radiates. It's the same idea. Whenever you dump normal matter down a big potential well around something very heavy and massive, it heats up and it gives off energy. Okay, wonderful. Let me do two things now. I want to thank you all for supporting the Slack public lecture series. Um, and thanks so much to Sunil for giving a wonderful talk. Mm.